Hey, good morning and welcome to the Women and Manufacturing Podcast. My name is Fran Brunel. I'm the president of Accelerated Manufacturing Brokers, Inc., a company that specializes in lower middle market mergers and acquisitions, but only within the manufacturing sectors. And I am your host for today's show. So today we are super excited to have with us Ellen Petrowitz Phillips. Ellen is the president of LEM Plastics and Supplies, Inc. She's a force in business, and she's been an advocate for women in manufacturing, which we love. In the past 20 years, she has created a vibrant community and a diverse client base that reaches an international audience. She's a third-generation entrepreneur whose mission statement speaks to her character. At the core of every interaction is an effort to be collaborative, cooperative, and kind. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Glad you're here. So introduce our listening audience to LEM Plastics. Tell us what you do, why you do it, who you do it for. Okay. Well, LEM Plastics is a precision machined plastic component parts house. We um, fabricate plastic uh, sheet rod tubing and film, and we do it in a build to print environment, meaning we make whatever the drawing uh, that the customer or the client needs. So they send us a drawing and then we make it come to fruition for them. We don't really design, but we like to stick our input in and help. Um, we have parts. Uh, let's let me start with LEM has been around for 49 years. I've owned it for 20. We have parts on the space station. We have parts on heart defibrillators, uh, blood centrifuge machines. We also have parts on every airplane you're going to step on. Um, Hellfire missile, Swarovski helicopter. Um, I'm it, it's it's mind blowing to me that when you go buy Budweiser, we we know that our parts are on at least six lines um, in the bud plants around the United States. Um, so we cover a bunch of different industries. There's communication factors. We've had a lot of parts that were on cell towers. So we've broadened our base across five or six different industry levels so that this way when one is on slow uh, it never really affected our 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 business we just we just rode the slopes that's fabulous and something that a lot of manufacturers don't understand the need to have diversification good for you so i want to ask you about you have had um you've got a very interesting perhaps the most interesting entrance into manufacturing that I've ever seen. And that's from the world of fine art. So tell us how that happened. Okay, so um, yes, I am a fine art major. I have a degree in drawing and art history. Um, I took up the challenge of art because I, I, I love making things. I've always loved making things as a kid. And um, that idea that you you just take nothing and you turn it into something of beauty um, just excited me. And it always made me happy. Um, art school was also a big challenge for me because uh, being in sales, and I don't know if you'll get it from this podcast because I seem to be tripping a little bit over my words, but being in sales, when you know your product, you're fluent and you can make anybody um, buy anything or, or understand anything or be excited about anything. and that's the way I felt about school. It was really easy for me. So art challenged me and it, I, didn't, I couldn't, um, for lack of a better term, I couldn't BS my way through things. I had to actually physically manifest something for every project. So I just loved making um, whatever I could get my hands on. My hands were always dirty. Um, and it brought me to many places. It brought me to many places around the world. Um, I got to study in Italy and um uh, just get a different aspect of what people uh, thought. And I think a lot of that culture also resonated with me in terms of they're very proud of what they were making. And we were carving marble and it was just, um, it was just this, always a story about how it just unfolded and it was there and you helped bring it around. That's the old Michelangelo theory that the 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 piece of sculpture was already in that block of marble and he just took away all the, pieces that were, you know, hiding it. So mm -hmm. I kind of always had that in me. And when um, 
I started uh, in manufacturing. Art is a very poor existence. I never made any real good money at it. So I always had a, a backup job and um, I was very good in sales. And this uh, this is what got me um, in plastics and I was selling electronics too. But um, it just, I understood what the guys were make, doing. I understood how they were taking raw material that looked like nothing and turning it into something. And to me, it was exciting to watch the machines and watch the things happen. So um, I just got more entrenched in the idea that we were making things. And all of a sudden we were making things that make other things happen. We may be making a widget or a little washer or component um, and not really know where it it went or what it did, but it was part of a bigger picture and it made something work. And then we, I started getting excited about that, which moved us into, um, we make things that make things happen because we know what our niche is and we may be at the bottom or the starting line for somebody building something, but it's mm -hmm. kind of exciting that we get to, um, get that end result and be part yeah. of it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really hate when people say we're only a job shop. We're just a job shop and nothing more. And you have an incredibly different spin on that. We make things that make things happen. And I think that changes the dynamic of a team and a staff where the work becomes more important because it's for something critical. How have you um, uh, worked to have your staff embrace that viewpoint and have they? They absolutely have, um, because it would get really boring repeating 10,000, <laughs> you know, washers popping off a machine. So they really have, um, to start, we, I used to ask the buyers and there were certain, um, there are certain, uh, contracts that we can't, actually know where the part is going or which right. part of the assembly it's at and that's okay but we they can tell us what the end result is so if a part was going on an f-16 i would make sure i got a picture of an X f-16 so that everybody had them around knowing that was it and then we moved on to um actually having the unit itself in the building. So we have a medical company that we did a lot of patient monitoring equipment and we'd have little parts in the back or whatever. And in that, in the late eighties, they were doing a lot of um, supplier interaction and supplier pat on the back, supplier days. And we're just, we're so happy that we have you as a supplier. And they were doing a lot of that. So we took it a step further and just said, Hey, why don't you come in and you know, just show our people what it is they're making. And they brought in machines and then they hooked them up to all my mm -hmm. machinists. And they literally sat there and watched the monitors work. And they got excited about the fact that they knew something they were making was going into that. So anybody who's got their family member in the hospital realizes that, hey, we could possibly have a part on that machine. Um, when COVID came around, um, we used to, we lined these uh, blood centrifuge tubes, these um very high precision metal tubes that need some Teflon inside them. And uh, that that volume tripled. And it, that was uh, something that happened to uh, like spark us in our own kind of COVID kind of way of helping, which we were tripping these out as fast as possible, yeah. um, which was going to help find that vaccine. So they get an attachment to something bigger. When you get on a plane, we want we want everyone to get on a plane. We want it to take off. We want it to be safe, land, and everybody walks away and kind of has a great day. And we take for granted that that stuff happens, but right. it can come down to the tiniest little thing that can make the problem. So um, for me, being able to say, hey guys, that's the latch that prevents somebody from ejecting out of the Swarovski helicopter. That's the um, that's the knob in the in the front of the cockpit of you know whatever uh, I think it was a, a Dreamliner or something whatever it was that we actually got to know the specifics of. Um, it allows a buy in. It gives a purpose to what you're doing. Yeah. And everybody here knows that when Anheuser Busch needs something, um, they're they're making a difference. They see it in their everyday life, and and it's just a neat connection, um, which makes it part of a bigger purpose. And we realize that we do we do a service. It's you know it's kind of and I'm not going to equate us to this, but it's the same with like the regular services you get every day. We take for granted you put the garbage cans on the end of the driveway and they come back to you empty. 
We take for mm-hmm. granted of those things. And sometimes job shops are taken for granted in that, in that respect, that it's just that down and dirty part. It's just that little nothing and you're not assembling and you're not building an engine, but we're excited to know that we're building parts for the engines that General Electric is putting on airplanes. You know, it, for yeah. us, we get, we get a sense of pride to know we're part of it. Yeah. Maybe a very small part, but part. You know, I I have two thoughts as you're talking. One is that um, for your workers, um, you know, I imagine at a Friday night cocktail party, it's way more interesting to say, um, I make things that are on every plane. I make things for this fighter. I make things that are part of what's living in someone's chest, keeping them alive. That, that that's like incredible. And the second thought I have as you're talking is if every manufacturer in the country approached it in this way, where they're actually helping workers understand the importance of what they do, would there be such a skills gap? Would more people choose manufacturing as a career? You know? It's and and I I hope people hear this and I hope people copy what you're doing because I think it's great. I think it's incredible. And you're, you know, listen, everyone's struggling with the skills gap, but those who are actively engaging their staff uh, in a more meaningful way are are those who are not having the same. It is the issue at the same magnitude as other manufacturers around the country. So good for you. Well, thank you. And it's it's funny because I don't I I know that there are programs out there to to tell you how to um, engage your employees and how to bring them around and all of that. But I think when you're a woman in manufacturing, um, you have a tendency to think way, way outside of like three boxes. Um, And women are just tend to be more intuitive and creative. And we come at solutions in a different way. It isn't because I said so, which is a great solution or because that's the way we do it or because AS dictates it or whatever. There's always, we can always paint that prettier picture. And for me, it was about painting that picture, but then realizing how much, um, Ferocity came with that picture, how much um, excitement could come around that. And, and it, it did its own job. I didn't even have to work hard at that. That literally manifested itself and, and got everybody excited to even look further and have even yeah. my salespeople asking more questions so that we can keep relaying that information. You're it's right. Women are more uh... Uh, relational, I think, in nature mm-hmm. um, as as business leaders, and um, it it serves us well. One thing that that strikes me: so you're a, a women a woman business owner within manufacturing. Um, you are a minority. One of the things I talk about all the time: so um, men are dominating the acquisition process of manufacturing companies. And one of the biggest categories of acquirers are those leaving corporate America to acquire their way into entrepreneurship. And I often say to myself, like, why aren't women doing this? Why aren't women doing it? Because it, you know, it's it's like younger baby boomers. So you're of an age where your kids are out of school, you know, you don't have those concerns, and you could you could kind of finally go, hey, it's my turn. So why aren't women doing it? For women that might be thinking of that, what would you say to them about? heading up a manufacturing company rather than just working in one? That is such an interesting question. And I, um, I, I would, I have to come at it from a, a specific way that I, I, I know works for me and works for the successful women that I know, because there's a few of us that I'm kind of close with is we've we live in a war in a in a in a space where we don't we don't necessarily take um 
no for an answer. We don't necessarily have ever been told, I would say, that we can't do something. I think we come from a, this needs a solution and we're just going to work on it and move forward. And um, as an entrepreneur, we have a tendency to do and then apologize later. We don't really ask for permission. <laughs> and I think that yeah. um, women coming into the space have to do it the same way. They have to not worry about asking for permission to get into it, not worry about asking for um, or getting a no from the money. Um, but coming in going, this is going to work. I'm going to show you why and being totally in that positive lane and seeing the end picture as happening because too often as we're preparing, we allow the doubt and we allow the, um, the what if scenarios to take us down the wrong rabbit holes. So instead mm -hmm. of using that as now we're prepared if that comes up and it's over here, um, we wind up holding on to it and go, but what if, what if, and then it starts to get dark as opposed to keeping the lights on at the end, end of that picture. So I would say to them, um, you're powerful and we can do this and we can be totally successful at it. And we, there are, there is money out there that will back a really good proposal, a really good, um, solution with data that shows its success rate and shows that women know how to handle this whole, the, this whole prospect. Um, I, I think the fear factor has got to go away. I think the, there's not any more women or women don't know, or the men are dominating. Well, you know what? The men need us because they have not been taught how to, um, maneuver the path to this, to the top or the maneuver, the path to success. We've learned how to jump hurdles and go to the side door and run over the back wall and climb a tree and everything else we had to do to get there. And they just walk the path. So they need right. us because that's how our thinking has, has gotten us as far as it has. Um, and what the better thing would be for, for us is to take all that information, take all that history that we we've, we've stored up and that we know of and start sharing those secrets share, collaborate, cooperate, and make that pie so huge that all of us are getting a bigger piece as opposed to stealing each other's. I think that when we start sharing these secrets and we start trusting each other, um, especially as women, uh, we, we're just gonna, we could just rule the world. We don't really need- I love it. That. I absolutely love it and completely agree. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about, you have a really interesting mission statement. Tell us about that. Uh, the collaborative cooperative kind? Yep, CCK. CCK came about during COVID um, and we were thinking about branding or rebranding or figuring out when we came out on the other end, how could we be prepared and what did we, what were we missing? And knowing how old our company is and um, of what generation I am, um, I've tried to surround myself with a lot of young people and figuring out, and I have a 19 year old son. So of course, all the way kicking and screaming social media and what platforms we need to be on and what we need to do. So CCK came up, up through a conversation of how are we reaching people? People don't necessarily, like I believe in relationships and building those, um, but the younger uh, generation understands that quality and product and, and, and relationship builds and all of that is a good thing, but it's not necessarily what they have been uh, bred to, to totally uh, buy into. So theirs is about how the give back, what the give back looks like, what, what is your mission around uh, what it is you do? Because I want to buy your mission. I don't necessarily want to buy plastic component parts. Um, so, it, you know, they could be as great quality and our price could be terrific, but they want to know what, what, what our give back is and where we are. And as we, we thought that through, we realized that we're not really a plastics machine shop. We're a customer service company. We service, yep. um, the needs and the pain states, pain points for our clients, for very big clients. Um, and. Part of that is that we've always been collaborative. 
we've always been cooperative and I believe in kindness. I believe that, you know what, I can wait three extra seconds for the person crossing the street who's going to come in the same door I am and hold it. I believe that I can pick something up for somebody who dropped it. Uh, Just those tiny little simple kindnesses, looking someone in the eye and saying hello to a perfect stranger. Those are the things that um, I'm, I sort of kind of miss as I go through my every day and watching my, um, watching my son grow up in, in a, in a different generation with a whole different philosophy. So we pulled this together knowing that as you're collaborative with your, um, customers, as you're, um, and even other suppliers, as you're cooperative, as you give as much information as you share, you teach, you learn from, as you do those exchanges, it just sparks ideas. It sparks solutions. It sparks um, forward motion. And if you can do it in kindness, meaning if you could remember that, you know what, maybe somebody had a bad day, or maybe you got that flat tire on the way to work. If you can remember to live in that space, things are so much easier. Um, CCK also came about, and I had been working on it way before um, we set it as our mission, which was uh, from Bernie Dorman and the CEO space. And about 20 years ago, I want to say 15 years ago, I was with him and um, he has since passed, but his foundation is still around. Uh, Bernie Dorman's uh, father sat like in a think tank kind of situation where he had Zig Ziglar and Bob Proctor and um, Disney and Ford and all those guys. And they sat around and they shared ideas. They made things better. They didn't do this on their own. It didn't just come to them. They had these conversations, same as our founding fathers. They sat around with a bunch of beers yeah. and they figured it out. We got very um, possessive of what, what was ours. And um, I think we need to go back to that collaboration because again, it's not about me taking a piece of your pie. It's about us making the whole pie bigger because then mm-hmm. everybody benefits from it. And he started that thinking for me and I brought it back and I've been working on it with my team so that we're all in that space. And then now we, we're trying to make it habit forming and um, spark it on to the rest of uh, the manufacturing world. So everybody we deal with as a supplier, um, we deal in those interactions. And when we start a, uh, you know, a, a group meeting for um, maybe quality, you know, quality audit or something, and we said, we're coming at this collaborative, cooperative kind, we're going to remember we're staying in that space. And that's how we start ourselves off, just so that we know that we don't come from a reactive place and we're coming in with this notion. Um, and there's only one other thing that I'd really love to tell you about with this collaborative cooperative that helped us build the relationships that, you know, that we have when we, we've had people give this back to us full uh, so many times. Um, and I, I, that's why I'm, I'm so passionate about making sure I keep giving out uh, when we had uh, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy, and it wiped us out and stuff, our our um, suppliers, but subcontractors and other uh, companies that do the exact same thing we do, um, came out of the woodwork and helped us. They let us use their machines. They took on subcontract yeah. work for us, and they helped us keep our customers um, happy and not knowing that we were as destitute and brought down as we were. And those were all relationships of, and they were all built on that collaborative property. And, and you know what, someday I'll, hopefully I'll be able to give them, give back to them and, and what, um, when they, when they're in need, but we, uh, we've been on the beneficiary side of, you know, of this. And, um, I really Mm. believe that the world could be better place if we weren't if we learned to trust and we learned that collaborative and cooperative and kind behaviors just yeah is the way to go just it's a very um it's a very emotionally intelligent approach to business and life I think thank you you know and I think too you know so many of the, you talked about your 19 year old son and growing up in a different era, um, you know, where everybody's on their phones doing this or on their computers. And it, I think that our generation can speak into it and help younger generations understand 
that it's still it, 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 relationally based, relationship based. People want to buy from people. I don't care how much happens on the internet. People still want relationship. And it's what makes the world go round. And you're right, the world would be a much better place if people approached not just business, but life in that collaborative, you know, kind way. So very nice. I, one other thing I want to cover with you. Often when people see um, someone very successful in business, uh, they'll say, wow, she's so lucky. But they don't know everything that went into that and all of the trials that you had to overcome to get to where you are. And you've had quite a few. You just talked about one, uh, touched on it a little bit with the hurricanes and, and what happened. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, so in 1997, I was an employee and um, Hurricane Floyd came through, and that was the um, apparently the hundred year flood kind of idea. It hasn't flooded ever, it never will. And we were in a different building. Um, and it was our first foray into disaster and what a disaster plan should look like. And oh my goodness, did we, we knew nothing. But we were able to um, rally the troops. And it's so funny because management. Um, had a vacation scheduled and took one look at what was going on and just said, here's the checkbook, deal with it, see ya. And they kind of left it in, in my hands, um, which then ultimately, you know, just catapulted me into, um, okay, what's the first thing we do? And I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but we did get that together after 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 Floyd and we built ourselves back up and stayed in the same building. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, public service had a transformer that blew off at the pole and we were the last stop. So everything had nowhere to go except into our building and took off our roof and we had a fire. And because it was public service, the firemen could only control the fire. They couldn't actually um, shut down the pole until public service came to shut down the pole. So they spent a couple hours, God bless volunteer firemen. Um, and they were able to, you know, cut holes in the roof and get through and, and really just keep it contained until they could put it out. So then we learned about uh, fire control. And then we learned about, you know, working with a, a hole in your roof and trying to put things back together and still uh, not living in that poor me space, or this is what happened to us or using it as excuses, because in business, a company like General Electric, a company like Rockwell Collins, a company like BAE Systems, these guys have to answer to bigger, bigger, bigger places. They have to answer to DFARS. They have to answer to the government. They have to they have to keep us, you know, safe in defense. The, the airplanes have to fly, whatever it is. So we couldn't be poor me. Um, we couldn't not fulfill our contracts. So we learned how to work around um, and and get that going, and then thought we had it all under control, thought we started like keeping records in a really great way. And then Irene hit and Sandy hit a year to the day later. And um, we wound up moving a building. But again, in that collaborative space, our IT partners at that time um, gave us their conference room. And they had us set up with new computers because we literally had everything washed away. We had over four feet of wow. water in the building. So even though we moved things up to three foot height, it just wiped it out. The computers were gone. Everything was gone. They set us up within 24 hours. We were back up and running in their conference room and they let us uh, rent their conference room and be there for almost a year while we found another building and tore ours apart and realized there was no way to stay in this building anymore. Wow. So um, that was a col another collaborative um, relationship build that just came our way and it was beautiful. Um, but in all of that, we learned we learned a lot um, about uh, being prepared and um, subsequently um, going into ISO and AS certification. Um, it all came down to an if then scenario. So if this happens, then we know what to do. And we had to do it through mm -hmm. trial and error, but it taught us along the way how to jump over those really hard hurdles and um, not living in the disaster part of it. Not, I remember being interviewed on the news 
And one of my customers called and said, wait, we just saw you. How bad is it? And of course, when it's on television, the drama has to be as big as possible. Right. And for me, the drama was I had no walls. I had no machines. I had no material. I had nothing. All I had is a bunch of employees that were willing to get dirty and throw a lot of things in a dumpster. Um, but we we had to keep that shining and that positive for the customers, which I think taught us that. Yeah, it was bad, but as long as we're staying focused and we're staying up and we're all healthy and alive and we're seeing the good in what's happening and ha and keeping our humor and um, keeping our group together and really doing this all as, as one, as one unit, I think it's what propelled us forward through all that nastiness. Mm. And it propels me every day. Um, I, I won't even go into all the personal struggles I have because I'll have you in tears, but it's the idea is, is that that's, it's a learning moment. It's the universe telling me, Hey, you know what you should have, or did you look at this or what are you not seeing? And why, you know, it's, it's, it's my kick in the butt of, Hey, get moving and go do that. Because if not, you know, you're not going to have anything, but we're going to, we're going to give you this challenge to show you. So if I'm not growing from every one of those challenges and getting smarter and getting better, then I, I wouldn't be sitting here with you, you know, today, because we would have been gone and wiped out and closed down. Yeah. Um, and we almost had that happen. Um, coming back from uh, both uh, floods, we had to uh, buy out a 45% owner, a partner who didn't want to be part of this rebuild and didn't want to wow. put any money in. And that was a year and a half of, of torture of trying to get that all arranged. And um, if you understand banking, anybody who owns over 20%, they've got to be on those loans. So right. I had a really great bank that, that trusted me and I put my house up and we worked from that respect. And then we got rid of the owner, but um, family, this is, I'm a second generation in, in a family business and that's, it has its all it's, it's other little trials and tribulations. Yeah. But I think they're all things that teach you if you're willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't willing to learn and I didn't want, I wanted to know why this was all happening to me. But what I found out was the more I, um, the more I did question, what am I supposed to learn from this? The, um, the easier life's journey gets, the smarter yes. you get, the um, the happy, you know, when you live in that space of there's a reason, I don't know what it is yet. Um, and then when you take ownership. So in the in the buyout for the client, in the fixing of the um the flooding, you know, I had to take ownership and what didn't I prepare for? What didn't yeah. I know? Am I coming at this the right way? Do you know, am I sitting? too far in my space, you know, all the way mm -hmm. over here and they're all the way over here. When am I going to start living in the middle and meeting people where they are? Yeah. And you, you could write a book on disaster preparedness for manufacturing know, companies. Seriously. It's funny because we go into um, big companies and they say, okay, what's your succession plan? What's your disaster relief plan? And I'm like, oh, I have one of those. I actually have one from trial and yeah. error. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it, it, you're absolutely right. There's a lot, um, there's a lot to it. Um, but again, I think we got caught in spaces that, that weren't supposed to flood out. They, you know, they weren't supposed to be. So um, as much as you can prepare, you, maybe, maybe you can't. And these things were supposed to happen to me, see how strong I am, see if I could actually pull together a bunch of people and turn them into a, a work family and, and if we could all um, go farther and take this to the next level and take this business uh, past the fact that it was a job shop and yeah. into something bigger. Yeah. Well, we are starting to run out of time. Um, if our listening audience would like to learn more about LEM Plastics, how best should they reach out to you? Um, well, our website is uh, www.l-e-m plastics you have to have those dashes it will it will reroute you but for some reason way back 40 years ago um, we did not know there was an internet and we did not know dashes were going to be annoying um, and we're also on LinkedIn we're also on Instagram and um, you can follow us on any of that we're really excited about uh, posting um, a lot of videos 
And uh, I have a nice uh, 24 year old who, who is very much living in that space yeah. and representing what's happening with us. Cause we have a lot of things going on at this point. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to, that has all the connections to me and my staff. And um, we reach back yeah. uh, when somebody has a question. Good. Thank you so much for being with us. This was informative. I think it will be helpful to manufacturers. I'm hoping it will be helpful to women considering entering the field. Absolutely fabulous. And best wishes for continued success. Thank you so much. And, and I appreciate having the platform and, and allowing me to talk as much as I did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and if... Um, you're a woman in manufacturing and you would consider being on the show, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Francis Brunel, or just call my office, 908-387-1000. And I'd also like to encourage all of our listeners to visit whampodcast.com, where you can see all of our shows and other shows brought to you by the Jacket Media Company. Have a great day, everybody.